Hello and welcome to The Pitch, brought to you by Livewire Markets. My name's Eddie Orchard, and today we sat down with David Wimborne, Senior Portfolio Manager of the Impacts Global Opportunity Fund. We're gonna be talking about some of the secular drivers in today's economy and some high conviction ways that you can play that theme. David, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. You look at an opportunity set of several thousand companies, but you whittle that down to a portfolio of around 40 names. Can you take us through your filtering process for achieving that? Yeah, absolutely. So um, this was really the key bit of thinking that went into the global opportunity strategy when we um, when we seeded the strategy. Um, so um, the strategy was seeded back in January 15, and we, to your point, kind of we had to think about a way to screen this vast investment universe for um, you know attractive sustainability opportunities. Um, and essentially, the the the, the process we um, developed over what well, started back in 2014 was a proprietary tool that we developed called the uh, Impact Sustainability Lens. Now, what the sustainability lens attempts to do is it attempts to highlight attractive opportunities at the subsector level within the market. And what I mean by that is there are, you know, essentially eleven big sectors out there: consumer staples, discretionary utilities, industrials, and so on. They branch out to 160 subsectors. And what we do within the team at Impacts is we go through all those 160 subsectors to try to understand the balance of opportunities and risks which might be present in each of those different subsectors. And you know, not surprisingly, some of those subsectors have a huge amount of risks and not so much opportunities. Others have you know great opportunities and, and less risks. And maybe just to bring it to, to life with one example, on the risk side, one thing we look at and in terms of our nine risks that we look at all of those subsectors on is supply chain dependency. Now, supply chain dependency really appeared as an issue during the COVID period because, of course, you know, global um, uh, uh, supply chains really just ground to halt back in March, uh, March 2020. And that really highlighted a lot of, you know, lack of resilience in many uh, industries' um, supply chains. And so two I would highlight there, one would be the auto component subsector, which has many issues there. And the reason why is because, you know, the auto industry is probably the most globalized industry you could imagine, you know. There's something like 16,000 components which go into a car. And, you know, as the CEO of one of the auto components companies we invest in said to me, you can't make a car with 95% of those components. And so if, if there's a problem anywhere there, you know, the whole industry has, has, an, enormous, um, has an enormous amount of problems. So the auto components uh, subsector would be a subsector with a higher risk for supply chain dependency. And just one other, which I think is quite interesting, would be apparel manufacturing. Because if you think of apparel manufacturing, particularly, you know, in the fast fashion industry, you know, a lot of those supply chains, uh, in terms of where the clothes are, are, are manufactured, is spread across the Indian subcontinent in Southeast Asia. And the manufacturing conditions are incredibly opaque. We don't really have any f real feel about what's going on there. So that would be another subsector which have a high risk for that particular area of supply chain dependency. And this just helps us map out really where to focus our investment energies. And we try to really focus on higher opportunity areas and avoid some of those um, high risk ones as well. And on that, you know, I know you outlined it a little bit then, but are there any sectors that you actively avoid, like the mining sector, for example? The, the way that I'd frame what Impact has always done is we have focused our investment and energies on companies that are on the right side of the transition. In other words, providing solutions, products to address some of these sustainability challenges. The mining sector, I think, is quite an interesting one because if you're involved in the mining sector as an investor from a sustainability perspective, I would turn that to be more of an impact investor. You're looking for to make a change in that company to make it more sustainable. And then if you drill down deeper and you look at kind of things like the, you know, the the um, the environmental standards of some of these companies, you know, they will probably under, come under increasing scrutiny over the time. You know, things like pollution and waste externalities from mining practices. And the reason why we're interested in kind of what that means is again, you know, it's it's not through necessarily altruism. It's because you know we think that these issues will come home to roost over the, you know the coming you know five ten years for many of these companies. And taking more of a more of a top down look at things, can you take us through some of the thematic opportunities that you're seeing in markets at the moment? I think, I think I'll probably zoom in here on the AI opportunity because of course that's sort of really capturing investors' imagination at the moment. Um, and so the way I would frame the AI opportunity within sustainable investment, it really comes in two main parts. The first is the area that I would turn to be AI enablers. And what I mean by that are companies that essentially provide the building blocks to enable the AI infrastructure to you know, uh, be built. There's two, two subcategories there. One is digital infrastructure, so the companies providing data centers, semiconductor chips, the machines that make the semiconductor chips, or uh, semiconductor chip designers. They're the digital infrastructure. But then, you know, arguably as important is the physical infrastructure. And what I mean by that is when you're building out a data center, you need huge amounts of heating, ventilation, and air conditioning equipment. You need huge amounts of voltage equipment, connectivity equipment, transmission and distribution equipment. 
So all of those companies in that enabler bucket, be they digital or physical, they've really been the focus of investor interest so far, you know, the building of what's been driving this uh, transition. We have significant exposure there within Global Opportunities and also our Environmental Leaders Fund. The second layer, which I think is a really exciting one going forward, is the layer of AI implementers. And what I mean by that are the companies that benefit from the application of AI across their businesses, essentially. So once this technology is bedded down, who's actually going to be using this technology in their operations? And there's a huge number of different um, uh, case studies from the companies I speak to where I can see a very, very clear path to them using AI very, very productively in their business. And none less so, I would say, than the logistics industry. Because basically, if you use AI in the logistics industry to optimize things like route planning, to make sure your trucks do the drop off at the right time, you save a huge amount of fuel as a result of that. Now, why is that such an important thing? Well, one, from a purely pragmatic perspective, it you know, saves these companies a huge amount of fuel in terms of their, shit, in terms of their trucking costs. But of course, the, you know, the other broader benefit is you, know, you save a huge amount of carbon as well and, and energy. So um, as, you know, as I believe might happen over the next couple of years, investor interest transitions towards the AI implementers, we have significant exposure to those companies that I think are really key beneficiaries in terms of implementation of AI. So I'm very excited about what that opportunity might bring over the next two or three years. And can you take us through an example of a business that you know fits in that bucket? Yeah, absolutely. So for, for me, one of the most exciting areas there um, is industrial software companies. Um, and why they are so interesting is um, if you take one company uh, in our broad investment universe called Autodesk, um, Autodesk, as you might know, is a provider of CAD design tools, so computer-aided design. And if you have any architect friends, you'll know that basically that is the standard design tool that's used in that industry. It's been, it's been the industry standard for decades now, I would say. Now, what is really interesting there is essentially if you look at the penetration rates of basically IT spending in, in the broad um, uh, buildings manufacturing um, sector, it's an incredibly un underpenetrated field. And what I'm really excited about is as you implement AI solutions into these CAD design tools, you can improve the whole design process. So if you're designing a particular building, you can use AI to optimize the way that the air conditioner should be on the wall or the lighting should be to optimize you know, every element. You can save a huge amount of um, uh, energy as a result of that. So, uh, so I think there's a, there's a really big implication there, um, not in terms, just in terms of energy efficiency, but also resource efficiency. I think everyone's talking about AI as this kind of big thing, but probably don't understand there's so many layers mm. of being able to invest in this in the, in the next decade forward. So really, really interesting. And thank you very much for your time on that, David. Yeah, no, thanks for, thanks for having me. And if you enjoyed that, feel free to give it a like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. We're adding fresh content every week.